Rocket Lab starts his neutron Archimedes engine tests, China's CMSA unrolls his new moonwalk spacesuit, Australia's Gilmour completes his wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX's Crew-9 capsule arrives at the ISS, SpaceX continues his second launch pad at Starbase, ULA gets frosty, SpaceX Falcon 9 second stage meets further issues which reduce the number of launches this week. I'm Christophe Paget from All of Our Space and this is your Space Update. Rocket Lab has developed his Electron Rocket, an 18 meter tall two-stage rocket fueled by liquid kerosene and oxygen, capable of sending up to 300 km payloads to low Earth orbit. It has launched over 53 rockets to date and has a growing launch order book. But Rocket Lab does not just manufacture and launch Electron, it also deals with satellites and space tugs. And it has not stopped here. They are currently developing a large rocket, 43 meters tall, capable of sending up to 13 metric tons to low Earth orbit, with a fully reusable first stage powered by nine Archimedes engines. These Archimedes engines are liquid, oxygen and methane oxidizer rich closed cycle engines expected to have high ISPs or efficiencies. Rocket Lab has used NASA Stennis Space Center facility to test its Archimedes engines and has recently made huge progress with it. Rocket Lab mentioned that Archimedes engine has gone through several hot fire tests, taking the engine through various operating conditions and tweaks. Previously, Rocket Lab has produced several neutron rocket parts, such as Stage 2 carbon composite tanks, Stage 1 common dome, or composite fairings. The China Manned Space Agency, or CMSA, has recently presented China's version of the spacesuit capable of walking on the moon, an ambition that China has and intends to reach by 2030 and set a moon base by 2040. The spacesuit seems much smaller than the NASA's version, containing more movement joints, therefore more flexibility. It is made to withstand the moon's extreme temperatures, as well as radiation and dust. Is the spacesuit already qualified? Well, I don't know, but after all, they have until 2030 to complete any qualification. The Australian company Gilmour Space is developing since 2012 is Iris rocket, a three-stage rocket standing 25 meters tall, capable of sending up to 305 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Gilmour has developed an hybrid propulsion with its Sirius engines based on 87% to 91% of the usual hydroxyl terminated polybutadine or HTPB and the rest made of polyethylene solid fuel. Four Cyrus engines power the first stage, one the second stage and Gilmour is using a Phoenix engine powered by liquid oxygen and kerosene on its third stage. This week, Gilmour has successfully carried out his wet dress rehearsal at his launch pad in Queensland at the Bowen Orbital Spaceport. What you are currently looking at is the Iris second stage. Following the test, Gilmour Space has identified some software updates and the need to replace two faulty valves, which solidifies this big milestone. The maiden flight is expected by the end of this year, currently pending launch permit approval and airspace management clearances from the relevant agencies. This week, the rescue vehicle, the SpaceX Crew-9 mission, arrived at the ISS and docked safely and was welcomed by nine astronauts and cosmonauts. Why a rescue vehicle? Well, in case you're not aware, it's because Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore were the test pilots of the Boeing Starliner capsule and had to stay behind in the ISS upon request from NASA. 
as NASA deemed the capsule too risky to return these astronauts back to Earth. For more information, please have a look at this episode linked in the description. Therefore, the Crew-9 crew were reduced from four to two members in order to return Sonny and Butch when the capsule is scheduled to return in late February 2025. At Starbase, the Starship number 30 was destacked from its booster number 12 at the launch mount, whilst the booster installation and jigs were removed, meaning that the booster number 12 is expected to stay some time on its launch mount. SpaceX is now starting preparing the foundation for building the flame trench for its Megazilla Tower number 2, and at the Sanchez site, the Starship Quick Disconnect arm started its construction for the Mechazilla Tower No. 2. October 2nd, ULA has successfully carried out a wet dress rehearsal ahead of his second certification flight of his new Vulcan Centaur rocket planned for October 4th, for which I will obviously report on the next episode. September 27th, CASC launched a Long March 2D from China for his mission Xijiang-19. On September 28th, SpaceX launched a Crew Dragon capsule for the mission Crew-9 with a Falcon 9 from Florida, with on board only one NASA astronaut, Nick Haig, and one Roscosmos cosmonaut, Alexander Gorbunov, to the ISS. The first stage flew for the second time and landed back to site. Incidentally, the second stage has had a small deviation from its planned deorbit path, but nevertheless managed to burn in the atmosphere above the water. SpaceX and the FAA are looking into the issue, no doubt at lightning speed to ensure quick return to flight, which meant that the remaining flights were delayed for at least one week. It's now the third SpaceX Falcon 9 incident this year, not to mention poor weather conditions lately, which both contributed to delaying launches. SpaceX was hoping to launch up to 148 Falcon 9 in 2024 alone, and as of the 3rd of October, SpaceX has launched 91 Falcon 9, that is including one Falcon Heavy, 91 launches in 40 weeks, making an average of 2.3 launches per week. There remain 57 launches by year-end to meet their goal. Therefore, SpaceX requires to launch on average 4.7 rockets per week, which is a hard task to achieve, especially with the small amount of drone ships it has in its fleet. Unless, of course, it reduces the payload weight and carry out much more landing back to site. So, SpaceX has to revise its strategy to meet its already ambitious goal. In summary, from January 1st until October 3rd, 2024, 182 rockets were launched successfully. Out of that, 112 were from an American company or institution and 45 from China. I leave you this week with another picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Carina Nebula, an enormous cloud of gas and dust home to several massive and bright stars, including at least a dozen that are 50 to 100 times the mass of our Sun. It's about approximately 7,500 light years from Earth. I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space. See you at the next episode of Space News.